Hello, everybody. And uh, um, today I'd like to say hello to everyone in Slovenia and in Talia, our distributors in Slovenia. And today what we're going to do is talk about uh, ethos and its applications and the science behind it and how we've been uh, achieving the results. So I'd like to thank Dentalia for in inviting us to do this talk and this webinar. Unfortunately, it would be nicer to be out in Slovenia and meeting everyone, uh, especially Rock, Rock Stern. And it would be, uh, it, but it's just one of those things. Um, I'm actually having my second vaccination tomorrow. So hopefully everything will improve and, you know, in the future, maybe we can start traveling again, which would be a great thing. Okay, so this bit of lack of travel is, is interesting because half, you know, man, one of the main reasons to going to all these conferences this is in New York, the ICI World Congress uh, a year and a half ago, is basically meeting people and sharing ideas. As, as dentists, we, we have a very insular job, very lonely job. So it's great to be able to go to these events to uh, meet other people, like here, Mike Picos, and talk about what people are doing and uh, what is happening. Um, because uh, this is what, the way a lot of information is shared and ideas are, are, are um, shared around. So unfortunately, we're stuck to uh, webinars and uh, this is what we're going to have to cope with for the near future. And the main idea of today's talk really is about synthetics and how synthetic or alloplast graph materials have moved on, have improved, and the uh, the improved results that we're actually getting. And this has been seen mainly in uh, the work done by in orthopedics, you know, for uh, for many years, uh, synthetics have been used. 1892 was the first time Driesman used calcium sulfate in, uh, in the repair of uh, thigh bone fat fractures, femur fractures. So it's interesting to see that what's happening in medicine and bone physiology is this big move towards synthetics. And um, where the vast majority of the new research in high impact journals in PubMed is now in synthetics. This was commemorated by a a stamp in the UK last year. Um, and it's to commemorate this massive progress that's being made with these materials and with the, the protocols that we use to uh, apply and achieve the optimal results. So for me personally, it's been a 20 year journey and six and a half, nearly 7,000 graphs now from when I first started using synthetics. Um, I just started using them because I went to an orthopedic lecture and it was interesting to sort of see the direction they were moving in. And then this was confirmed by uh, the situation of when alloplasts, I mean allografts were being used uh, that uh, the raw material had been uh, stolen in effect from uh, at the morgues in, in the American uh, bone bank. And this encouraged me further to start looking at synthetics. So, I've been working and mixing and working for three or four different companies, and it's eventually led to the development of Ethos, which started in 2013, took three years to get regulatory approval. This is part of life. Um, and, um, and now is at the situation where in, we're in 65 different countries, and uh, we won Small Business of the Year Award in 2019 in the UK. So the growth has been really good. And the results have been really emphatic and it's great to see more and more dentists moving into this direction of thinking because that's what it is it's it's more of an ideology of uh, how we look at bone healing and um, bone regeneration and the success really of all grafting you know whatever material you're doing is getting the basics of good surgery and understanding the basics of bone biology, understanding of what's happening. You know, there's a lot of people who often talk about things and mention biology and then do, are doing things which make no biologic sense. So we've got to really understand, and that's the important part. Occasionally I hear, it doesn't matter what material, I remember seeing someone who uses xenografts and remember, oh, I used that material 12 times and it didn't make bone once. 
No, a lot of these things work and a lot of them work despite the host will heal despite what we do. So we've got to remember it's not the material that's making the bone, it's the host. So therefore we've got to understand mechanisms and the protocols that we're using. Why do I not use a membrane? Well, this is some research. We're just doing a, a full write-up, uh, which hopefully we can publish in the future. And by using a membrane in this particular site, in rabbit calvaria in, in uh, critical size, cortical defects, um, where we used the membrane, we found there was 50% less blood vessels in that new bone. And as we understand, all of healing is about blood and about the, uh, the effect it, uh, it has on the host healing by oxygen and by bringing BM, uh, proteins and bringing BMPs into the site. So the um, moment we're using a membrane, we feel that we're impeding healing. And this is something that our medical colleagues have known for quite a long time. So I know it's quite a thing about not using a membrane, but this is the basis to everything in true bone regeneration. True bone regeneration is just a saying where we haven't used a membrane and we're using materials that are fully bioabsorbed, so we have the host bone only. So this is our aim. As dentists, yes, we like to um, make things, screw things, cut things, and so it's important that we also use our biologic and our medical skills, which we learned when we were at dental school. Yes, it makes it a lot easier to, when we um, filling a hole or building out, uh, augmenting Buckley, if we have these big, uh, particles of AHA, say a xenograft or anything. And these um, particles help build a scaffold and they help fill the hole up. But what they are essentially is, that's it. They just fill it, they're bricks. So when we actually look at this in a conceptual idea, the actual human bone would be the cement. So as you can see, when all these bricks are in place, there's gonna be far reduced human bone. And this is widely researched and widely published. We know this is as, as a fact. And when we look at our own studies, where we're having biomaterials that bioabsorb, you can see here's a graft particle, which is being resorbed by uh, the new bone formation. And what we like to see, what we're seeing generally is 50% new host bone at 10 weeks. And in this case, it was only 8%, but sometimes there's 12%, and then there's higher, more vital bone in some cases. But that's the average. So this is an important factor that all of this material will turn over to human bone in a time. And this is the key to what I refer to as true bone regeneration and have done for the last 10 years or so. Because when we compare this to a similar study done by, with the same histolo histological team, except that this was over six months and we're over 10 weeks, we see the, the importance of not using fillers if we can help it. And when we look at it, we see some new uh, human bone forming in between the bovine bone. But when we look at it histomorphometrically, the human bone is the red. And the green is the bovine bone and the blue is, is, is the ethos. And here we really sort of see the story. By placing a lot of bovine bone, yes, it fills the hole, but it ends up with a far reduced amount of uh, human host bone in there. And this may have a, se a severe impact when the bone is in function and needs to turn over. And so therefore this may impede the turnover and this has been many recorded and published cases of having a necrotic sclerotic situation in the graft. So we like to heal our hosts and that is returning them back to their own bone. Here's a, one of the biggest systematic reviews on um, bone and grafting uh, done by uh, Homley Wang, Homley Chan of Michigan University. And clearly it says here, residual particles in a graft led to 23% less bone in the site whereas alloplast synthetics led to 22% increase in bone. Um, we, we do see an all grafted sites a reduced connective tissue component, um, and we'll show you this later on. I like to place as early as I can, and, and then again, load as early as I can within reason. Um, and we're doing a lot more immediate and immediate loads at the moment. Uh, if you, you look on case studies, you'll see a case I just posted today. Um, and this is because the implant itself upregulates bone metabolism. And when we load it, as the metabolism is dying away, fading away, we then get a secondary spike due to functional remodeling. So if we're looking at 
graph materials, which we're going to talk about particular graph material. I'm not going to talk about blocks or anything else. Otherwise, we could talk for a day, not an hour in a bit. We look at the research here by Nick Matthias and Nicholas Lang and Ian Yip in Hong Kong University at the time. These are the ideal properties of a graph material. This is the one I like to place by a bone because it, it contradicts a lot of what these guys actually believe in. Um, but this is what they saw as the ideal properties. Osseoinductive, conductive, biocompatible, totally replaced by bone, appropriate resorption. So in other words, as the graph material is resorbing, it's replaced by host human bone. Graph stability, volume stability, that's important. Mechanical, make it easy to use, no disease transmission. And the only material I felt that fitted into all of these categories is beta tricalcium phosphate. And this is where we've been spending a lot of time working. I've been looking at these materials for 20 years, and we feel we finally got to a nicer situation with the development of ethos. So what is ethos? Well, it's, um, it's beta TCP with a, a calcium sulfate actually acting as a built-in barrier function, and this actually stabilizes the graft as well. So ethos is 65% beta TCP, 35% calcium sulfate. The benefits of the calcium sulfate element, biocompatible, 95% of my patients do not take a painkiller the next day. It's created a stable environment, as we know from the research of Schenck, stability is important for new bone formation, has bacteriostatic properties, which is nice, especially using in infected sites. It, it does help the situation. We can reduce the dependence on antibiotic usage. And you remember that uh, in products like Stimulan, calcium sulfate pellets are infused in medicine with antibiotics to treat very extreme intraboney infections. And this is why they, they are chosen to use this. It leads to improved soft tissue healing. We see this all the time. Uh, I can actually take my sutures out in most cases in three, four, five days. And it bioabsorbs that three to four weeks. This bioabsorption creates further space for improved vascular ingrowth. And therefore, we get improved antigenesis. And as well, as provides nutrients for the mineralization. Look, we can talk all day on calcium sulfates, but we've got limited time. And that's ethos. We've published a lot. If you visit ethos.dental, you can see all the studies and uh, comparisons and look at our histology. And we've published in a number of different languages, Italian, French, Greek, German. And again, if you look on ethos.dental, you can see them. Um, one last point is about osteoinductin. Uh, this is a, um, a paper by Rick Myron. Um, this is his most recent one on the topic. And uh, this is in, in a nice high impact research uh, journal. And uh, he's published two with Danny Busser and the Byrne Group uh, showing osteoinduction in synthetics. Um, in medicine, it's a given. There's over 300 papers, uh, high impact papers on PubMed stating these materials are osteoinductive. So we have to look at that and accept what the research is showing. So do what do we want if, you know, if we want a good picture, good x-ray to stand up in the conference, then I put some HA in because it's going to give me a better x-ray. It's going to give me a better looking x-ray. Is it going to give me a better situation? No, I don't think so. And the body doesn't think so either. So when we have a less of a visible x-ray, because all the HA is not there is resorbed, we can then assess the cases better for long term to assess the function and to assess the uh, the bone quality in the case. And yes, by placing um, you know lumps of crop that are going to stay there forever, it does tend to um, give you a better X-ray. It may interfere with the bone to uh, bone to implant surface, whereas we prefer the conceptual idea of the material all bioabsorbing. This does lead to a slightly more um, um, sort of dense uh, grafted site with less connective tissue, as we noticed, what, as we saw in the, in the research by Homle Wang, Homle Chan. Um, but if we leave particles up against the implant surface, as you can see here, this may be a situation which could occur. Uh, and, and it may impact the long-term ability of the material to turn over, especially against the 
uh, implant surface. Because this is essentially what the patient wants, what the body wants, and what I want, is to be able to have all in bone um, with no foreign material, only host bone. But as you can imagine, building a, a concrete wall without any support is a lot, a little more complex. And so therefore we need ideas and clinical, technical ideas on how to improve this. And this is what we're going to show you today. I'm going to try and make it very case heavy, not so science heavy. So you can look and see basically what we are doing and what we are learning about to do. This is just one technique, the suture technique, and I'll show you that in, in, a, in a minute as we're going through. Because that's what we want. We want host bone without foreign material that can just continue to turn over and it'll keep its profile and keep its volume as long as it's kept in function. Uh, and I, I've seen that in thousands of my cases. So it's important to have it in sites where it'll be in function, then we'll keep the volume and the profile. Um, the only way to assess bone, I often hear lecturers standing up and they point at their case, which is full of uh, a xenograft or something. And they say, look at the bone quality, look at the quality. You cannot tell the bone quality any other way than histology. You, you can't look at something from and say, look at the quality of the bone. The quality of the bone can only be assessed one way. And it's important to always include this because uh, histology gives us the truth of what there is there and the, the, the percentage and histomorphometry giving us the percentage of new bone, percentage of residual graft material. And that's the only way of assessing uh, quality of bone per se. So generally, I find, and what we see generally is that somehow using these, these methods, whether it's the calcium sulfate or whether it's the fact that the bone quality is um, very high. In other words, there's very little residual graft material or no residual graft material. So I think this high quality bone improves, helps the host improve the soft tissue. So I look at helping the host regenerate the hard tissue and I let the host do the soft tissue. I've published on PubMed in one of the top journals on soft tissue uh, surgery and I hardly do it. I do, you know, maybe a handful, two handfuls of soft tissue grafts a year um, because I find that the soft tissue improves when I've actually just helped the host do the hard tissue. So here's this case from before. And here it is four years later. I've done no soft tissue grafting, just hard tissue. And I think the reason why we have this nice longer term stability, um, we'll go through the case because here you can see we've got a buckle defect on this anterior implant. And here it is four years later. And you can see we have nice honed bone regeneration. And this uh, is just as you can see by using the ethos up against the site on the buccal site where the, uh, the um, implant was, the threads were showing. And here it is six years loaded. Why are we getting this long-term stability? Because of this, not just the keratinized tissue, but it's attached keratinized tissue. And this is because we have high quality host bone underneath. And this will give us this long-term stability where we won't have pocketing, we won't have bacterial in, uh, introduction. Um, where it may lead to peri-implantitis, again, only if the, the host has a poor host response to bacterial inflammation. So it's not something that happens all the time, peri-implantitis, periodontitis. It's a host-driven response, so a poor host response. So this is important to look at as well. I'm going to show you this briefly because not to do this, um, I do them, but um, I'm not saying this, it's not a protocol. I've only been doing it for six or seven years now, so it's, it's still not, um, uh, and it's not being published, so it's just an opinion. So when we're actually going to look at this case, you can see the nerve was down there. You can see we've got effectively a four-wall defect, little buckle defect here, and a thinner, correct, uh, thinner mucosal uh, tissue. And we're going to just place the implant with no bone to implant contact and no primary stability. So as I said, this is not ITI protocol. Do not do this at home. Um, never overgraft with these materials. They're regenerative, not augmentative. So we're going to help the host regenerate. Here it is at 10 weeks. You can see we've now got nice thick keratinized tissue attached. And we've got a turnover to new host bone, which required 
a round bow in this case to access the implant. And you can see we've got nice corrupt, nice tissue here. And we then take an Ostel a week later. So that's 11 weeks, 77. That's higher than we would expect if we place this implant in a adjacent bone, healthy bone site. And what we've done here is by using a preservative, uh, a regenerative approach, we've kept the profile, kept the volume. So when we look at it at x-rays, you can see no bone to implant contact. Uh, 10 weeks, we can see it turning over to host bone. It's turned over to host bone. 12 weeks loaded, one and a half years loaded, and two years scanned. And if we look at this, that's two years loaded, the scan of two years, and we can see we have adequate new host bone. Yes, it's slightly more dense. As I say, it's not residual graft material that's creating this uh, um, appearance. It's that the bone is more dense and it's a reduced uh, connective tissue component. Here it is loaded four years, and here it is loaded five years. The case is coming on to six years now, uh, this particular lady. Yes, other guys have pushed this even further than me. This is my um, Swedish friend, Ludwig Hansen. And you can see at 12 weeks later, he's got 81 on Ostal in that site. And you can see host bone has grown completely over the site requiring around burr to access the implant. This is another one of my cases where I've done a lower seven. And you can see I've just used the, the uh, cover screw driver to actually place the implant into the material. Put more graft material, suit your clothes with PTFE. Here you can see with the bone losses, try to clean as much, but it's a difficult area because you have to watch out for the, for the nerve. Um, place the implant. Yes, I should have placed probably a 10 millimeter, two millimeters, one and a half millimeters longer implant, but it's a nice wide implant. And then we've grafted with stable uh, ethos over the top. Five days later, we remove the sutures and you can see we have nice soft tissue healing. Here it is at 10 weeks, and we now have nice host bone growing over the top of the implant. And when we raise the flap at 10 weeks, we can see we've got good quality host regenerated uh, hard tissue bone. Needing a round bow to access the site. Can you see down the implant down there? I'm taking a little bit more off that, than um, I should, because in actual fact, we're gonna need to get a nice emergence profile in this case, as you can see. Here at, um, at FIT, you can see we need to clear this bone away in this side, otherwise it'll impede the fit of the implant. And there's the end result restored. This has been restored six months now, in this case seven months. I'm sure there will be no issues. But generally, where we published in 2015 is a set protocol, how I started and the vast majority of my cases have been done using this protocol. And again, it's on ethos.dental. And um, here we use an extraction three to four weeks later, I place and graft. Why three to four weeks? Well, because at that period, we can get soft tissue closure. And at five weeks, according to Aglu and uh, um, Lars Schropp and all the researchers on bone, we find that the modeling of the bone starts at five weeks. So what we're doing is we're getting that short window so we can get soft tissue and place the implant, get it into some function and graft before we, the modeling starts. So in other words, we're looking at a, re, a preservative regenerative approach. Then I loaded 10 weeks, but 10 to 12 weeks. Um, I've followed this protocol for 19, 20 years now and done about six and a half, seven thousand grafts uh, at the moment. I do probably one or two of these a day, every day, using this simplified regeneration protocol. So this is actually using the simplified regeneration protocol. And in this particular case, you can see we've got a small defect here. Um, so we're gonna have to regenerate the tissue around. I extract the tooth. There it is, remove the curette, the cyst, remove the cyst initially with the curette. And here it is after three weeks healing. Raise another flap, you can see by papilla sparing as by the research of Dennis Tana. And then we clean the site really well using degrain. Can you see, we've got a little defect here and it's cleaned very well using degranulation burrs 
and we can then place the implant. This is not going to be guided. I'm going to only have two or three threads holding this in, so we're going to have very low primary. As you saw from the pushing case, we don't really need primary. I place this implant in the optimal site, not too palatally, and graft the palatal side first with a wetter mix. I then place the implant. Here I'm using a pearl top implant. And you can see it hasn't got much primary. It's moving around a little bit. Um, and that's not important because we're not going to be immediately loading it. It's bleeding a lot. It's better to go and have a little bit of a break for coffee or tea or something. But in this particular case, uh, we just moved on. I graft the site and I get my nurse to hold with the sterile, uh, dry sterile gauze. And there it is placed and grafted, getting ready to suture closed, suturing closed first at the papillae, and then just suturing lightly on the inside. I'll show you later. Then this case was restored at 11 weeks, and you can see we have a, a restored profile in the particular case. Um, this case is loaded about five years now, so I should get her in to get long term. But this is the scan before, and the scan at six months, and you can see the host has regenerated the defects and we have an implant now. When we look through, you can see the small defect before, over here, and there's the root. When we look at it over six months, this is a, uh, the scan six months later, and you can see, yes, we've restored the profile. Um, you know, there's probably a very little bit of graft material still uh, needing to turn over, but probably only 10% or even less. And here it is two years all the graft materials turn over and it's now a stable site. So loaded two years. What we'd also notice with these materials is again, this was very low primary, same sort of situation and grafted, loaded six months and you see the position of the bone and then loaded three years. And when it's in function, we are constantly getting improving sites and it does improve buckly and vertically. You can see, the bone has improved vertically on this case. And again, this case is about five years uh, loaded at the moment. So when we're looking at uh, just an, another simple case with a, a vertical root fracture here, you can see by the bone loss here, place, all we did was the same thing, remove it, let it heal for three weeks, raise a flap, place the implant, a DO implant, and graft here with some ethos material. Can you see here? and uh, here it is at 10 weeks, and you can see it's turned over. You can see the way it looks different. It's turned over to host bone. We need a ramber, access, and then loading. Here it was just loading, uh, just re-cementing it. I think it was six months. And here it is loaded four years. And you can see the difference again. As it's in uh, functional remodeling, we get this vertical improvement and a seal. Look, this is not just because of the ethos. This is multifactorial. It's the abutment design, it's the host response, there's, there's a number of things. Um, it was interesting, I was looking at the, 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 uh, the Danny Boos, the sort of 30 years GBR um, uh, lectures uh, the other day, and it's good to see that uh, even Danny realized that uh, beta TCP obviously is uh, material that provides the most new uh, host bone in, in his studies as well. Anyway, here's this case now loaded six years as i say it's not my case referred case so i cannot redo the crowns um but anyway there you go and we have stability at six years and this allows us to look at even more complex aesthetic zone cases like this where a lady came from new york she had a big party to go to in 10 weeks she wanted to have her own teeth she didn't um, and she wanted an improved look. Uh, she's got these big composites on here. You can see it's polished there. But, um, and, uh, but she didn't want to necessarily have a block graft or she didn't want to have a titanium mesh. So we had a look at the case. And yes, up here, there was only one millimeter of bone. So this became a little more complex. It was about two, two and a half millimeters in, in width. So again, not the easiest case to do. And what we've done here is created an osteotomy by lifting the palatal uh, tissue away, the, 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 the keratinized tissue there. And we started palately and then coming out buckly. So you can see this is a 3.3. This is a, a, a narrow, DO narrow. And you can see we've placed graft on the palatal side. And then that's all we graft. 
we never overgraft with these materials and we find that um, it, it works better. The reasons why not to overgraft is you bring in the periosteum, which is the key to all the healing, closer to the grafted site. Here it is at 10 weeks, so she's ready to now have a, her, these are temporary uh, Marylands. Um, what we did here that I didn't like, little mistake, yes, maybe I shouldn't have extended these, the incisions onto the mucosal tissue because you get scarring in the mucosal. It's fine on the keratinized tissue, but you can get scarring on here. And because of this ultra high lip line, uh, this is an issue. I should have known, this is exactly what I've published on, so I should have known better. But here it is two years later. Yes, there's a slight bit of scarring, but overall the case looks good. We've got good soft tissue, good hard tissue, and a stable case. Many ways to do one walls. You can use blocks, you can use curry techniques, you can use uh, you know, cages. I'll show you some cages being used. But this is just showing how simple we can actually make things um, by just helping and working with the host on the healing. I don't drill holes in the plate, especially on the uppers. Some people I know have done on the lows or feel that they need to on, on, on the mandible. I don't do it, um, but uh, and I don't seem to have any problems and I've been doing it, you know, this for 20 years. So we've just placed the implant with a few threads showing buckley and we graft with ethos and the stability that the material has allows us to not use a membrane Therefore, we can go straight into optimizing the uh, healing effect of the periosteum, which is nature's miracle. You know, I haven't used a membrane, as I say, in over 20, over 20 years. And the way I look at it is that the body's healed perfectly well for thousands of years, in, in millions and millions of cases, by using the periosteum until a dentist came along at the end, at the late 80s, and decided that somehow. Um, a pig collagen membrane was going to make the body heal better. It's just simply not true. The, you know, the, the miracle of biology is what, what helps the healing. Anyway, here's the case now loaded. We're loading it at 10 weeks, and here it is loaded at one year. And when we look at it at a scan, one year later, there's obviously no residual graft material. You see we now have a nice new buckle plate, which is going to create uh, um, of host bone, which is going to lead us to long-term stability. So because we're doing this regeneration rather than augmentation, sometimes we need to do a layering because putting a lot of graft material on doesn't help with these particular materials and this procedure. What we need to do is possibly do it over two phases. This is probably a better way if you have a bigger site. Anyway, this is not really a bigger site, but it's um, it just gives you an idea of what's going on. Yes, what we've got here, loss of uh, keratinized tissue, loss of palatal plate, buccal plate. And, you know, this was referred to me, young lady, 35. She, again, she wasn't keen on having uh, animal or human donor material. Look, I don't care about that. I use these materials because they perform better, not because of what the patients, uh, but it does make things nicer for the patient. You say to them, what are you putting in me? What are you grafting with? Oh, I'm grafting with something, just calcium phosphate, building blocks of your, your own body. It's all going to resolve and be turned over to your own bone. Doesn't that sound nicer than, oh, I'm going to, you can choose between a horse pig or another dead guy. This makes a lot of sense to the patients. To me, I don't really mind. It's, uh, you know, I'm doing it because I'm seeing nice results. So that's all. So in this particular case, we've lost the bone on the adjacent tooth on this premolar. And it's important that we regenerate this bone because this bone is going to be important for keeping the papillae long term. Um, I'll explain something later on, but we now realize that we can actually regenerate over these fenestrations and, and dehiscences on adjacent roots. So maybe I should have extended this flap just a little bit to about here and extended this flap. So maybe my flap design here was not, um, not optimal, but everything worked out okay. And again, what we can see is the loss of the buckle and the palatal plates. So we've got to build vertically and a little bit horizontally in this case and restore the bone here. Don't clean this root surface here. People often ask me, what do you do? Do you put embergane? Do you do this? No, I don't do anything. Everything is here. We feel that this progenitor cells uh, for the regeneration of the PDL already on that side. So we do not want any 
overt uh, heavy mechanical cleaning to take it off. So here we're going to do now place a, an any ridge implant. This is the level I'm going to place the implant to. Okay, the rest is going to be outside the residual host bone. As you can see, putting it into a wet mix because we've grafted the palatal aspect first. Here's the buckle plate going here. And as you can see, half the implant is vertical to the buckle plate. But the way I'm looking at this implant is that it's one to two millimeters subcrestally, as it should be for this system. And you can see there it is there. That's the horizontal uh, grafted site as well. And we're going to just graft with a little more dry, making it drier, just add less saline in or take more saline out. Better to add less saline in. And this allows it to set harder and it creates this drier mix, which then forms a nice hard casing on the outside. Suit your clothes, the PTFE, I prefer at the moment. And again, you can see by suturing on the papillae first, this is five days later. I don't close on the palatal side. And this is because I didn't make a big releasing flap. Can you see? There's no big releasing flaps. We don't overgraft. The reason for not doing big releasing flaps is it tends to mobilize all that soft tissue. And then that mobilized soft tissue then is more at exposure to the muscle pull of the case. The other benefit is by leaving this gap open, what have we done? We've moved this keratinized tissue two millimeters buckley, and therefore we've helped uh, reducing the need for any soft tissue surgery later. Here it is at 10 weeks. Now we're actually keeping this um, papilla sparing as in line with the Tarnow research, because now you can see we've got new buckle bone up against this tooth. We've got a new buckle plate. And yes, the implant is now one millimeter, two millimeters subcrestally, as is for the design. I've just placed a little more ethos just to improve the situation and sutured clothes with a healing cap. There it is there. A week later, I fitted a bigger healing cap just to improve the profile. I like using Cervico now, as you'll see. And there it is loaded. Um, this was 13 weeks after it doing the initial grafting. And here it is loaded at one year. And you can see we've restored the situation. Now she's only got her own bone um, and she's got an adequate outcome with keratinized tissue and restored the profile and restored the soft tissue by doing very little actually. Um, and that's the key is actually the less material we use, the less surgery we do, the better the result is going to be. Why? Well, the body's doing 95% of the work and it's going to heal despite what I do. So it's better to encourage it to do the work that we feel uh, would be better. Right, here we go. Um, and as you can see, that's the bone loss on the adjacent tooth placing the implant grafting. You can see the implant was only half the way in when we placed it in. Here's at 11 weeks, we're filling the wider healing cap and loaded. And we scanned it at six months because I was doing some work on the opposite side. And the interesting thing at six months, you can see we've now got a nice new buckle plate, nice new palatal plate, and nice regenerated bone on the site. And this is why we have that nice aesthetic result. This is the really interesting thing. This is up against the adjacent tooth. And as you can see, we now have nice new host regenerated bone on that site. This is just doing the same on an upper, upper canine. As you know, with upper canines, I always like my referring dentist. So, oh, don't worry, I'll take the tooth out. Yeah, they'll take the tooth out. They'll also take the buccal plate away, especially in an upper canine. So we've left a small defect to repair. Again, cleaning the site is really important here. We are doing papilla sparing. Why are we papilla sparing? Because we've got good bone on these adjacent teeth. Therefore, it's important that we keep the papillae as per the work of Tano and uh, I can't remember the other studies. There's a few studies on this. Again, just using a dryer mix. Try not to cover over the cover screw. Otherwise, you will find you won't be able to exit. So dryer mix, less saline. Turn upside down. You'll see it's a nice sticky mix. Again, same thing, keeping it open on the pilot. And here it is at 10 weeks. There is what it looks like at 10 weeks. Raise a flap, again, just to access the implant. And you can see we've got nice new host bone. Round bird to access it and clean the site.
and that looks really quite nice. And the good thing about this again is with these materials and regeneration, it allows us to get screw retained. And you can see by the angle here, even in this without having to use a coaxis implant, we can get the screw retained. Yes, Blue M gel to help soft tissue healing. I've seen one or two cases, it happened to me once, when, when we're taking crowns on and off, or there's a loosening of, of the crown, you may get bacteria in. And with this new bone, before it's fully turned over and matured, we may have an issue where you get lost bone. So Blue M gel or even letter mix whenever you're using multiple trying on and off with temporary. So there it is there. And that six months restored. I didn't do the restoration here. There's another dentist. I get a lot of referred cases. So often I don't get the opportunity to restore them. This one I did restored was referred to me again. We have a small defect. And the interesting thing on this case is that after we clean, can you see the same process, wet mix on the palate, place the implant, there's the implant in the optimal position, and then a dry mix on the outside. That's the dry mix coming straight out of the, the cartridge. Can you see what I mean? And there it is there. Now, the interesting thing was this area here. Can you see I haven't got much primary out of this, but it, it, it doesn't matter because I'm not immediately loading it. And I didn't clean as much as I could have should have around here because I was a bit worried about causing long-term effect, but it doesn't seem to be a problem in the long run. Here's it 10 weeks. You can see it's changing and regenerating here already. And here it is loaded six months and loaded a year. And you can see we've got an adequate result. Loaded two years and loaded four years. So that's before, this is loaded four years and loaded six years now. And you can see we have nice stability, nice papillar stability. And this is important. And this is, I think, is because when we look at the x-rays, this is the site before and loaded four years, loaded six years. You can see we have nice stability of the host hard tissue underneath. Yes, there may be more complex cases. And here we may need meshes. This is done by Ludwig. Um, I'm starting one or two mesh cases at the moment. I've always been using the suture technique, which I'll show you so I avoid doing meshes, but Ludwig has a small defect here. You can see there's a little bit of bone loss and he's gonna use an iGen mesh over the ethos. Uh, at 12 weeks, he then removed the iGen. You can see he's got nice crap, nice tissue. You can still really see the dents in the iGen on the new host bone. Um, interesting thing, where he had used the eye gen, he actually had slightly better bone. So I think the stability of these meshes, and I, I've got a whole lot of cases done, done by about, ooh, about five or six or seven different dentists, and they've all had amazing results. And the, the ones I like the best, the mesh I like the best was the Ostem implant system mesh. Um, and, and that seemed to give the, the bigger the holes, all the research showed that I'm trying to remember again, it, it's old research from the early 90s that when you're using membranes, the bigger the holes in the membranes, the better the result's gonna be. Um, I'd have to go back to my really early lecture to look at it. Anyway, so 14 weeks here, it is restored, and you can see it's a reasonable uh, result that he's achieved. This is done by William Yu, another young guy in the UK. And again, you can see we're building out Buckley. Again, he used an iGen mesh. I just don't have the pictures in here because of time. And you can see there's a few threads showing, plus you can see it's broken the buckle plate. This is a thin plate. He then got exposure of the mesh at seven weeks and he had to take it out. He was expecting the graft material to just still be graft material. Well, it wasn't. This is eight weeks. So from there to there is eight weeks. And this is by optimized host healing, by optimizing the use of the membrane. The, the meshes I'm most keen to use are these ones, these, uh, um, made in Germany and um, a friend of mine's just doing some cases at the moment. So we'll sort of have a look and see and maybe get into using that sort of support later. But in the meantime, most of my cases are actually done using this 2PDS suture technique. And this case was referred to me. You can see we've lost bone. We've got a knife edge ridge here at the top um, and the sinus is right here. So this is really not much to work with, you know, a little bit of research, a little bit of gum loss here. Yeah, maybe I should have grafted a little bit there, easy in hindsight. And you can see we've got vertical loss as well of the hard tissue. You can see the knife edge ridge here. Okay. And so even when I did the osteotomy, I had to go slightly palatally of this knife edge. And I tried using 
versa and the bone was more cortical and I couldn't move anything. So I decided I'd rather uh, you make two holes with this green stable of built drills. You can see one hole there, the other hole there. I'm then placing this implant. I think it was a four by 8.5 any ridge. Now I'm going to place it more buckly. Um, there it is there. That's it placed. So I'm going to grow vertically and horizontally going to help the host. You can see this knife edge ridge here. So we've now put the suture. All this is is a short section of suture. You put one end in the one hole, bend it over, put the other end in the other hole, and then you can graft and it supports the tissue away from the graft. Suture closed again, blue M, and I've used an aura aid. The patients normally take these out after an hour, so it's not neither here nor there. And here it is at 10 weeks. We've now got a nice big wide ridge. I've had to use a round bird to access the implant. So that implant was sticking up by two, two three millimeters. It is now two, three mill two millimeters subcrestally and we've got a nice wider ridge. So we've managed to regenerate both horizontally and vertically. And here it is, when we look at it, there you can see how little bone we had to start off with, placing palatal graft, buccal graft. Here it is at 10 weeks. You can see now the bone yeah, is to the top of the implant, maybe slightly over the implant here. And we send it back to the repairing dentist. This was three months, four months after she came to see me. Yeah, it just needed maturation and she came to see me two years later and yes you know what we can see is the tissues improved here we've got nice stable keratinized tissue and looking at the x-ray you can see we've got nice vertical and horizontal long term i'm sending her for a scan because we're doing some work on the other side and again you can see when we look down more on the profile you can see how this case has improved from before and two years loaded you can use this crossover style technique, which helps things be, uh, better. But I, I often just use the single, there's more than enough support. And again, this guy wants to have a tooth, have it all, not have a block, not have this, not have that. And he wants to, you know, wear his dench that he had already, which was some horrible sort of Essex type uh, uh, denture, which I didn't enjoy much because it was destroying this papilla here. So as you can see, obviously, when we raise a flap here, I should have, yes, extended this flap further here because where this bone needs the site here, we can actually regenerate that. So we've got a few flap threads buckly using the suture technique over grafted, not over grafting. The good thing is I did this case after I've seen what we can do. Can you see I've grafted over this fenestration and we will get new bone formation. Here it is five days later, and you can see what have I done again? I have this healing on the palatal side by secondary, so we've moved a bit of keratinized tissue buckley. Here it is 10 weeks, we raise a flap, you can see we've got very solid bone over the top, new bone and early bone formation buckley, this all's looking really good. And there it is uh, a couple of days later, and yes, he's been wearing this temporary denture that he has, and it's not done the best to the world to this papilli. So that's going to be our major problem. Um, the, the screw exit point, I wish I'd used the coaxis here, came just closer to the edge, so I decided to make the cement retained. And there it is, there fitted. Yes, he's on a whitening mission, as you can see. Someone's been uh, polishing these teeth and whitening them, and there's scratches on them. You, had, you know, a lot's been going on. But um, there it is before, and there it is after, and that's why they're a lot whiter. Now, as to this distal papilla, this is our problem. I'm trying to get him to keep it clean, but as you can see, he's already got plaque on there. But what we're noticing is, yes, this papilla is coming down, and uh, I'm going to see him in a couple of months' time. In another month's time, I'm sure the papilla will be better. And the reason for this is the gap from the tip, uh, the zenith of the host bone here on the adjacent tooth to the contact point is only 3.16. And so, therefore, we're going to get regeneration. Partial extraction therapy, uh, you know, I, I do a couple of these, not many. Um, it mainly it takes me a long time to do them. Um, you know, maybe I'd get better if I did more of them. I don't know. Anyway, so the, the real problem for me is that you need to a obviously section the, the take the vast majority of the root out, leaving the buckle bit. You have to really reduce this buckle bit down to a very thin 
to create enough space to have a space between the implant and the 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 uh, um, the remaining of the remainder of the root without actually placing the implant way too far palately. So I'm using a co-axis here, so you can see I'm using this 12 degree measuring pin. And you can see I've taken it down. I took it down even more than I placed the ethos into the site and we placed the implant here. You can see we're using a co-axis here. So I'm gonna rotate this around further. And here it is 10 weeks later uh, at loading. And as you can see, yes, you know, we've, we've managed to maintain a nice buckle profile. Uh, I think, you know, I would probably get a similar result with or without the PET, but I like the idea of PET. It makes a lot of sense. It's just, it's just a little more difficult to do. And I, I struggle a little bit, I must admit. So here it is now loaded at nine months. Yes, this patient is not an ideal patient for, for many things. You can see there's a lot of perio issues, a lot of poor dentistry. Um, I, I get a lot of referrals from uh, NHS practices in the UK and I cannot touch everything else because there's a very tough no-go zone between NHS and private dentistry here for financial reasons. Yes, yeah, just doing an immediate place and load. I just posted a nice case today on Ethos Case Studies, the Facebook site. And uh, again, you see, now I'm going to remove the whole route. Here's the site. And we're just going to graft on the buckle aspect where there was a, a, a defect buckley, especially higher up. So we're going to graft with Ethos. I'm then going to use the coaxis again, so that allows me to place the implant in optimal position, yet still maintain the ability to screw retain using a peak abutment. Here, I'm using a cervical system to optimize my emergence profile. This is the cervical system. You'll see me using it in, in other cases in a minute. And here is screw retention of the temporary. And we look at it and here's a week later and you can see it's looking very healthy. And 10 weeks later, we are at impression time. So you can see we have a nice emergence profile created by the Cervico system. And a week later, two weeks later, we're fitting the crowns. And again, you can see we've got nice tissue. We all know about the sort of the, the junctional epithelium and, and the, uh, the stratified tissue. And what we have is maintained a nice volume in the case without losing the volume. And then here it is restored six months. Yes, there's a slight bluing underneath. It's this tooth again, I get caught. There's a lot we should be doing. Um, but again, it's another NHS case where, you know, it, I have to be very careful about what I propose to be done. For large, this is Vas and Vagalma's cases. And you can see from before, three years later, you can see this nice dramatic improvement and look at this keratinized tissue um and th and this is a side effect but we we often it's a side effect that we like another case of fast and you can see before and three years later nice new post bone buckley um just before we'll show you robert oretti's case uh, another friend of mine and again here what he's using is an allergen uh, aller allergenic block this is rocky mountain but what we're really going to learn is these fenestrations, what happens here. So he grafts over with ethos. <coughs> and about four months later, it was locked down, so it was left longer. What we notice is this nice new host bone that's grown over where these buccal fenestrations. And if we look at it on a scan before and after, you can see this new buccal bone that's grown over the uh, adjacent teeth. This is why I always now extend my flaps in cases where I feel there's a need to extra, graft extra is restoring that now. So we can get cases like this and restore them and restore them with only with the patient's own bone. And this is the benefit of these materials is that it allows us to do that. Yes, in this case, I placed the implant here and I should have placed it more right there. Um, you know, we live and learn from everything in hindsight, but this is the mesial implant. And you can see we've got a little buckle and palatal defect. And here it is nine months uh, loaded, and that was before on that premolar. Here it is nine months later, and we've just got host bone there, right up to the top, and nice thick bone so that we have nice thick tissue. And here it is now loaded three years, that case. So again, we have stability of both hard and hence soft tissue 
over a longer period of time. Again, all of this research is on ethos.dental, but whoops, um, let me just, but I'll just show you this and we'll, we'll rush through a couple more cases. I suddenly realize, you know, I put too much in again. This is a xenograft and yes, it works. You know, there's, there's hundreds of cases, it works really well, but there's still the vast majority of this, even at eight weeks when this was on, on rabbit as equivalent 12 weeks, um, it's mostly bovine bone. This is autogenous, the gold standard works, but we lose volume, we know this. And the interesting thing is with ethos, we maintain the volume and we're getting over 50% new rabbit bone at that time scale. So this is what is an interesting thing when we look at it purely physically, it interests us. When we look at it on a micro CT, as, whoops, sorry, uh, as we're going through, this is using Xenograph, same rabbit, same level, Yes, we're getting some conduction from the outside, um, but not a lot going in here. Whereas when we look at the ethos, what we're seeing is this osseoinductive effect. So the vast majority of the high quality bone is this bone right in the middle here. Can you see? And we can see that when we look at it, um, at exactly the same level, same rabbit with xenograft and ethos at eight weeks, which is rabbit equivalent, humans about 12 weeks. And again, this is often explained by Rick Myron, amongst other people. And the benefit of it is when we're using the ethos, we're we going to get this 50% new host bone. Whereas when we're using a xenograft, you know, at this stage, we're going to have a lot less and we'll have more uh, xen uh, xenographic material between. As we've published, and again, this is uh, on PubMed, as the graft area goes down, osteoid area goes up. And the interesting thing is, yes, we do get a reduced connective tissue component. Looking at the osteoinductivity ourselves, we're growing in muscle tissue of a rabbit, and we can see osteoid up against the materials in the middle of muscle tissue. So again, showing this osteoinductive effect. Do implants fail? No. Nope. It's mainly the host tissues that do. So it's important to look at everything. Uh, look at uh, SSRIs, omniprazole, uh, vitamin D, cholesterol, all of these things. And it's also always important to make sure your implant is really clean and not polluted. So we've got another five minutes or so, another 10 minutes, sorry, run. We'll make it a little longer. Um, the money tooth, the lower molar, referred to me that was only four weeks soft tissue healing the retained root I tell the dentist to leave it in i can take it out a lot easier when we're doing the osteotomy it'll come out easily place the implant to the correct level which for this system is two millimeters subcrestly as you can see it's placed to the correct level and then we just graft again not over grafting then suture closed you can see there's very frail healing but this soft tissue helps protect and um, helps regenerate the site. Here it is 10 weeks later. And when we raise a flap 10 weeks later, we've taken, you can see we've got nice new host regenerated tissue. You can see the connection uh, uh, of the blood vessels to the site when we're lifting this nice thick keratinized tissue away. We then need a, a, a rambo to access it, 78 ISQ. Yes, we get higher ISQs. I don't think I've got the seven-year follow-up, but I've got seven-year follow-up on this case, which it doesn't really matter. It looks amazing. So it allows us to, when we get referred cases like this, you always say to the patient, how was the extraction? The patient was like, oh, yeah, the, the dentist really battled. And you can see that he battled because he's taken all the buckle plate away. And when we look at it, yes, we know, again, we're placing the SM plant two millimeters subcrestly, and that's all we're grafting. Nothing more, nothing less. Here it is at 10 weeks. You can see the bone. I'm not going to raise a full flap here because the patient was a little more difficult. And we just put a healing cap in. And it's loaded two and three years now. And when we look at it, you can see at three years, we've got nice host regenerated tissue. Can we grow vertically? Yes, this is a posterior mandible. But just have an expectation, moderate your expectations. It's a regenerative process. So to, to get 10 millimeters here would be laughable um, because the material is just not going to do that against the forces of the muscles. But can you see when I place, I'm only doing three millimeters vertical. And what do we get? This is loaded two years now. You can see we've got nice vertical growth of three millimeters and 
this allows us to have this nice uh, sized crown and nice keratinized solid tissue there, which is going to give us a long term result. You know, Ludwig showed this as well on 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 his case, and um, you know, in this particular case, not good keratinized tissue. We want to grow horizontally and vertically. You can see it's placed into the socket site here, overgrafted a bit. But here it is at 10 weeks. Where are the implants? They're under a few millimeters of new vertical growth. And when we look at it, pull this away, you can see new horizontal and nice keratinized tissue without doing any uh, free gingival grafting. You can see the vertical and the horizontal. You can see from there out, so, and the effect on the soft tissue. So this brings me to using cervical. I'm doing a lot more of this, and this is just a system whereby we measure our optimal emergence for a molar. Lift the site up, you can see degranulate the site after lifting the flap up again. Placing the implant to the correct level, we can use this to measure the, the, the up to the zenith of where the soft tissue will be, which will be about four. I'm having to imagine a lot here. And as you can see, the implant here is two millimeters subcrestally again. We then just using a shorter, wider implant here, and we're making a cervico uh, abutment. Okay, there's a little bit of a defect buckly, uh, palately, and you can see we've got a little buckle defect. So we just graft the palatal defect, graft the buckle defect. There it is there. Suture it closed, blue M gel. Here it is uh, five days later. You can see the healing by secondary on these papillae. And here it is getting ready. This was at about a month. There was a little bone chip came up. And so I decided to remove that and place it on again with uh, Blue M. But you can see already how this buccal tissue has improved and how we're getting a nice emergence profile um, because of the cervico system and the ethos. They go well together. And there it is. All you need to do then, you don't need secondary surgery. You just take the cervico off, place the implant, and here's the end result, uh, five months loaded. Um, I'll get this at a year, but we, we'll, we'll find that the bone will go right back to this level. Uh, I like these systems of implants. And again, it allows us, gives us this flexibility, this bimenas. You can see we've got a loss of keratinized tissue. We graft with the ethos, and then we just put a cervico arrangement and here it is three months later, go back to the referring dentist. I mean, you know, look at that, that he's got nice, look at that nice thick buccal emergence profile from this before, and it's all done by the host while we're at the beach. And this makes sense to me. Sure, you can just do normal socket grafting done by Johnny Cochran. Um, his technique is unique. He puts a lot of vital sutures in, and here it is 12 weeks later, you can see he's now got a nice butt, a nice ridge in this difficult lower as, uh, anterior zone to place the implants and, and restore it. Tunnel grafting, again, you know, don't do this unless you've got experience at it or you understand the basics of what's important because it is a little more difficult than you see. We've got a lot of cases ourselves, but we, we do less because we, we, we know how hard these are. And all we're doing here is lifting the periosteum, small graft. This is my uh, receptionist. So, you know, she didn't want to have a lot of surgery. She'd had a lot of surgery on the other side and found it uncomfortable. So all we're grafting in is that amount to improve the buccal volume and to improve the soft tissue. I didn't have the surgery photographs, but I'll show you surgery x-rays. I somehow lost them. All I did was make an incision, place the implant and a little more buccal graft. But here it is another 10 weeks after the initial 10 week period. And you can see we've got nice keratinized tissue and a nice volume increase in this case. 75 on Ostel. And here it is loaded two years now. And you can see we've got nice volume. And this was the x-ray taken at surgery. And you can see when we place the implant and graft a bit more, this is two years loaded. You can see we've got nice st stable tissue. And this is five years loaded now, um, and she's still very stable. So we've taken it from there to there as a long-term uh, result. And, you know, she's, she's happy with, with the fact that we did minimal surgery in this particular case. Sinuses, we won't go much because we're out of time, really. 
I published a bit on it. Uh, this is a 10 case perspective study. And it allows us to do multiple jobs, to do graft the sinus, um, fix the buccal defects, there's the sinus, so grow bone vertically, stabilize the periodontally uh, involved tooth behind. I didn't even show you perio or apisectomies today, that's the problem when you've only got an hour. But here it is nine months loaded, and you can see we've got vertical growth, we've got great new bone in the sinus, and we've got support of the periodontally involved tooth behind. And at four years, it was a porcelain fracture, so it took the crown off to get it repaired. And you can see we have nice tissue stability long term. This case loaded six years now. It also allows us, if we see the sinus here, to improve the vertical because that's important when restoring molars. You can see, you haven't put the implant all the way in. You can see some graft material over the top. And here it is two years later. And you can see there's the new bone in the sinus. There's the vertical improvement for an improved restorative platform. Do I want to have a big full sinus full of uh, xenograft? No, it doesn't show any function here. It shows me the exact striations of the function of the implant in function. And you can see again, the critical thing is growing this area vertically as well. So you can see that's the grafted site, a little bit in the sinus, and here it is four years loaded. And this allows us to have this nice crown. The crown's not up there because we've helped the host regenerate vertically. And this allows us to have nice new, I mean, nice papillae at four years. So it's important to do that. Yes, we can easily put foreign material in it. It looks great on x but When you scan it, you, you begin to wonder what the value of this, especially when it's floating up there. So it allows me to take another look at sinus augmentation. If you can see the, remove these two teeth, it was only one millimeter. So I've socket grafted rather than doing anything. 10 weeks later, we've now got nice new bone. So we don't have to do a lateral window. That's the soft tissue at 10 weeks. That's the new bone at 10 weeks. So it allows me to use Versa. That was me with Ziv Mazur. And you can see driving the ethos in with the reverse techniques, place the implant, a little more graft. You can just see just to improve the vertical on this case. And here it is loading at another 10 weeks. There it is loaded and loaded two years. Again, what we have is nice tissue stability. This is important. And by not having foreign material, you can see the effects of the new cortical plate, the thickening of the bone, the new bone distally, because we know there's no residual graft material. Yes, I still do lateral windows. Here's a lateral window because there's only two millimeters of bone here. I just thought it'd be safer to do a lateral window. I graft through the osteotomy, place the implant, it then pushes the graft, it starts coming out the window, seal the window with the dryer mix. Mistake here, I should have trimmed this filling a little bit. It would have helped improve things. You can see 2.5 millimeters, and here it is at 12 weeks. You can see we've now got nice new thick cortical plate, nice new bone, and allows us to restore that. So that was before, that's restored. If I'd polished this here, I think the bone here would have been a little better as well. So it allows in even more dramatic cases like multiple oroantral communications. You can see we got oroantral in a thin of tissue here. So I used DAS to get in. As I was lifting, pus was coming out of this oroantral. So I just did it as much as I could, packed it with ethos, bacteria static nature of ethos. And that's eight weeks later. The oroantral communication is now healed, hard bone. That's the lateral window healed at eight weeks. Take the tooth out, uh, the root out, out of the palate. And now we've got 10 millimeters of bone to place a new implant. This case is actually loaded for years. We don't really have the time to go into it, but we're on the last two cases now. So we're going to look at a big cyst removal case. Um, as you can see, uh, we set it off for histology. And this is the cyst that we're removing from the site. So it's a, it's a reasonable size, not too big. Um, and it left us with a little defect in, in the site of the removal of the tooth. And we're going to graft it. Um, we, we probably should have grafted this a little more. I did this with Mines. Uh, in hindsight, you know, we were worried about getting, you know, obviously we couldn't get as good a closure as we wanted. And also the patient was a bit nervous. This tooth here, this second premolar was incredibly mobile. It was just moving around. We were worried about losing that. But anyway, 10 weeks later, 
this is the site we had. Yes, there was an unusual small little hole here, which we just degranulated and grafted again. And what I've done, as you can see, I've degranulated, and this is the osteotomy for the implant. And again, we're going to use we use the two PDS suture technique. Can you see here um, to help uh, support the soft tissue? We're looking at the X-rays. There is the big cyst. There is the graft. Yes, probably could have grafted a little more. Uh, this is one month post-op and one year post-op, and you can see how it's all regenerated now, and we've got stability back in this tooth. Um, so that's just doing the grafting procedure um, and the placement of the implant, uh, the any ridge implant. There it is there. And you can see, you know, we probably could have placed this a little more uh, palatally, but we're going to actually regenerate this bone buckley. So there it is there grafted with the ethos. And here it is scanned two years later. And you can see we have a nice buckle plate on the site and we've regenerated all the host bone has been regenerated in the site where that big cyst was here it is yeah you know if we did some soft tissue we could maybe but you know she's happy everything is stable and i'm happy with the case um we're doing a lot more research on this at the moment in zygomatics the important aspect is that the bone and hence the keratinized tissue is important right at this emergence not necessarily in here anyway we just put a buckle fat pad as you can see from here over over this side but this is important for the long-term success and to prevent this happening uh, so it's important that we, we're looking in this and we're looking at nasalis we're doing a lot of work on that and the real benefits we're seeing when we're doing these zygomatics is this nice thick keratinized tissue and this solid area here and this is going to help with long-term uh, success of uh, the implants yes so you know this is i've just been asked to help work on a, a massive deformity case and uh, this is at st george's and uh, they're often using ethos this is a hip graph so using with hips and even ethos by itself and then they're seeing a nice improvement as you could see from all our other cases so um i know it's a real quick brush through and i even spent longer than i wanted but it's just to give you an idea of what we're doing how we're seeing results and how we're looking at this true bone regeneration this idea of actually optimizing the periosteum like our doctor friends do uh, without using a, a membrane and without using foreign material that uh, is non uh, residual foreign material. So I'd like to thank all the dentists uh, whose uh, work I've shown. I mean, I've got a lot more. They, the interesting thing is, uh, you know, if you visit uh, you, uh, Ethos case studies on Facebook, um, you will see that we've got a lot of other people adding really interesting cases in all the time. Visit us at ethos.dental website to again have a look at cases that we have there, or just a broad section of cases. And if anyone wants to contact me, that's my email address, peterdent66 at aol.com. Uh, so I'd like to thank everyone in Slovenia for listening, and uh, hopefully I'll come out to see you all soon. I'd like to meet Rock sometime. And, uh, uh, and also thanks to uh, Dentalia, uh, our distribution in, in Slovenia. And hopefully we'll see you all in the near future. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.